Hello everyone, welcome to A plus BI. This channel is all about complex numbers and in this video we're going to be solving an interesting equation with complex numbers. By the way, this is the second video for today. I just felt like doing two videos because I had some extra time. Anyways, I hope you enjoy them. If you haven't checked out the first problem, go ahead and check it out because that's a really interesting problem, in my opinion. I could be wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, and let me know what you think. I also have another channel which is called CyberMath where I do algebra and number theory problems. CyberMath, cyber with an S. Okay, cool. How do we solve a problem like this? First of all, what does solving mean? Well, it's basically me, it basically means finding the values of Z that satisfy this equation. I say the values, but how many solutions do we have? What do you think? Is there only one solution? For example, is this Z equals I a solution or Z equals one a solution? You can check it out. I mean, you can plug in some values for Z because this is about complex numbers, right? Did I say that? Well, if you're new to complex numbers, go ahead and check out my lecture videos. I forgot to say that. I usually say that at the beginning. Anyways, to, so you can test out some values to get an idea. Kind of like to get, that, get a feeling. It doesn't solve the problem. You can try a thousand values because we don't know how many solutions we have, right? Well, we sort of do. And this is called a locus problem because you'll see in a little bit why. But for that reason, and I... I apologize, A plus B I, which is the name of this channel, I'm going to use Z equals X plus Y I this time. And you'll see in a little bit why that's the case. Why that's the case. Okay, so let's go ahead and plug it in. Argument, ARG is the argument, by the way. And I'll tell you what it is in a little bit. But again, if you're new to complex numbers, go ahead and check out the lecture videos that I made. Hopefully that'll help. And if you have any questions, always let us know in the comment section. So... Let's go ahead and put the imaginary parts together and then put the arg again. Now, argument is basically the angle. So whenever you have a complex number, let's just say we have one plus i, I can graph it on the coordinate system as a, you know, a point or vector, whatever. And then, of course, it's going to represent a point in the plane. And that's called the argon plane, by the way. This is called the real axis and this is called the imaginary axis. So they're kind of two dimensional. And then by connecting it to the origin, you find the modulus or the absolute value. This is called R. And this angle is called theta. Okay? That's a positive angle measured uh, from the x-axis or the real axis. In the counterclockwise direction, that's what makes it positive. And it's usually measured in radians. Make sense? So we can write a complex number as R e to the i theta, where R is the modulus and theta is the uh, argument. And thanks to Euler, we have a beautiful, beautiful relationship, okay, with the formulas. I mean, the formulas have relationships. <laughs> okay, so where do we go from here? Um, there's a couple things to talk about. First of all, R e to the i theta can also be written as R times. Again, thanks to Euler, we can write e to the i theta as cosine theta plus i sine theta. And this is called the most beautiful equation in math if you replace theta with pi because you get e to the power i pi equals negative one, and now put the negative one on the left-hand side, and you get the following equation. And one day we can talk about, maybe Monday, we can talk about the proof of this. Like, where does this come from at least, right? Not a rigorous proof, kind of like a lousy, lousy proof, okay? Because I like lousy proofs. I don't like rigorous proofs, because they are too rigid and rigorous. Anyway, so how does this help? Well, we do have our number here, right? Let's call that z. Well, never mind. Z was x plus y i. So we can call it. How about w? Okay, great. So now w can be written as x plus y minus 1 i. In other words, this form. But we need to turn it into exponential form, right? So for that, we need to find r. r is the square root of, from the Pythagorean theorem, this one. And if I divide the real part and imaginary part by r, because think about it x plus y i can be written as r on the outside and x over r plus y over r on the inside. Now, this becomes cosine theta, this becomes sine theta. You get the idea? Cool. That's how we do it. So this is r and I need to divide the real part by that so that I can write it in the exponential form. And then y minus 1 is the imaginary part, but that's divided by modulus as well, right? And of course, don't forget the i, otherwise... I will be offended, right? Not I will be offended. I won't be offended, but I will be offended. 
okay? So this is my number, uh, w, and what do I know about that? I know that its argument is pi over 2. So argument of w is pi over 2. What does that mean? It means that cosine of this is pi over 2. I mean, cosine of pi over 2 is this, and this is the sine of pi over 2. You got that? I could also look at the tangent, but guess what? Tangent pi over 2 is undefined because cosine is 0. You see the problem? That's kind of problematic. That's why I want to look at cosine and sine. But you can still look at it because dividing by 0 makes it undefined, so you can go from there. But this is, I think, better. And we're going to do some crazy stuff here. Not too crazy, little crazy. So what does that mean? It means that cosine pi over 2, actually, I know cosine pi over 2, don't I? I mean, at least I do. Cosine pi over 2, if I forget, I can always use my pretend that I don't know, right? Uh, it's 0 because cosine is here, sine is here. So cosine of pi over 2 is 0, sine of pi over 2 is 1. Let's write it down so we don't forget. This should be 0. That means x is 0. Nice. Cool, cool. So that means the real part is boom, gone. What about the imaginary part? Imaginary part will be very interesting because it's equal to 1. <laughs> what do you make of this? <laughs> well, it just means that y minus 1 is equal to this. But at the same time, I know that x is 0. Uh-oh, that makes things a lot easier. If x is 0, plug it in, you're going to get y minus 1 equals the square root of y minus 1 squared, which is equal to y minus 1, right? These two cancel out. Uh-oh. I got an identity, y minus 1 equals y minus 1. We're done. Let's go home. No. Don't do that because the square root of a squared is not always a. It is the absolute value of a. You got to remember, y minus 1 is real. We're not talking about the square root or the absolute value of a complex number. We're using, well, we're kind of talking about it, but hopefully you get the idea. So I can't do the cancellations. That's incorrect. So what I need to do then is use absolute value, and that would give me y minus 1 equals the absolute value of y minus 1. Because absolute value of a squared is, okay, never mind. I mean, I meant the square root of a squared. Square root of a squared is absolute value of a, if a is real, of course. If a is complex, that's a different story. So what does that mean? The absolute value of something equals itself. That means that thing is positive. Yay! So y minus 1 needs to be greater than 0, which means y is greater than 1. So that's one condition we got. Another condition was x equals 0. Put those two together, and you should get the solutions, right? Let's go ahead and check it out with two things. One of them being Wolfram Alpha. It says x is 0, y is greater than 1. So did Wolfram Alpha get it right? I think so. But let's go ahead and take a look at this graph. What does that mean? It just means the imaginary part y is 1, but the x values are greater than 0. Now, here's the problem with that. Is this graph going to work? What do you think? Okay, something to think about, right? So let's go ahead and go back to the original equation and kind of argue how we can, uh, you know, prove or disprove this. Well, if you think about it, argument of z minus i was equal to pi over 2, right? Or did I say pi? Wait a minute. We kept, we kept working on pi over 2, but if, if it's pi, oh, I'll be surprised, okay? It's pi over 2, so it's good. Uh, I think I used... Did I use... Anyways, whatever. So <laughs> here, if argument of z minus i... So for example, let's take a number from here, right? So suppose x is positive. Let's say x is 2, y is 1. That means 2 plus i is not going to satisfy. So this graph is wrong. I don't even know where that comes from. Wolfram Alpha, you win this time. And this brings us to the end of this video. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. I'll see you next time with another video. Until then, be safe, take care, and bye-bye.